Amanda Knox was found guilty. Good evening. Tonight, Amanda Knox is once again a convicted killer. Amanda Knox's verdict has just been read guilty. In 2009, Amanda Knox was convicted for the murder of her British roommate, Meredith Kircher. However, in 2015, Knox was acquitted by the Italian Supreme Court of Cassation. Let's take the story back to the beginning and you be the juror. On November 1st, 2007, Amanda stated that her and her boyfriend, Raphael, were eating pasta when Meredith came out of her room and said that she was off to spend time with friends. See you, chow, she said as she headed out the front door. Those were the last words the two roommates would ever exchange. Later that afternoon, Amanda and Raphael went back to Raphael's place. They began to watch a movie. Around 8.30 p.m., Amanda realized it was one of her regular work nights at La Chique. Upon checking her phone, she was relieved to find a text from Patrick Lumumbaye telling her that, after the Halloween crowds the night before, he expected the night to be slow and she didn't need to come in. Amanda texted back at 8.38 p.m. See you later. Have a good evening. Amanda turned off her phone, just in case he changed his mind. When the movie ended about 9.10, they ate a fish dinner and went to bed. The next morning, Amanda walked back to her place and found nobody home. She noticed a smear of blood on the bathroom faucet. She took a shower before noticing what looked like more blood on a bath mat. Then she noticed feces in the toilet. None of her roommates, she knew, would leave a toilet unflushed. Something was wrong. Amanda grabbed her purse and ran out of the house. She called her mother first, then her roommates. She called Philomena first and learned she had spent the night at a boyfriend's and that her other Italian roommate, Laura, was in Rome on business. She dialed Meredith's number. No answer. Amanda walked back to Raphael's and described the scene at her villa. Raphael said they needed to go back and look around. Back inside, they gasped when they opened the door to Philomena's room and found the window shattered and glass everywhere. The room was a mess, with clothes piled everywhere. They next tried opening the door to Meredith's room, but it was locked. They went outside to see if they could peer into the room from an outside window, but getting a look inside proved impossible. They called the police. Raphael and Amanda were hugging on the driveway when an officer from the postal police approached them, shortly after Philomena arrived. Upon learning that Meredith's door was locked, she began shouting at the police, demanding they break open the door. She never locks her door, Philomena said. The postal police resisted, saying it was outside their authority. But Philomena's boyfriend, who arrived with her, succeeded in kicking the door open. What they saw was horrifying. Everyone out of the house, now, shouted the police. Inside the room, a foot poked out from Meredith's comforter. The walls and floor were streaked in blood. Lifting the comforter, Police saw Meredith's body, get from the waist down. A sliced-off bra lay next to her body. Her T-shirt was saturated with blood. Her neck showed multiple and deep stab wounds. In the afternoon, police questioned Amanda and Raphael separately. Police interviewed Amanda, first in Italian and then in English, for six hours. Although Amanda did not know it, police already considered both her and her boyfriend suspects although their first working assumption was that the kid was probably someone Meredith met at a Halloween party the night before. But Amanda raised suspicion because they thought the break-in looked staged. They thought a killer who would cover a naked body with a blanket was most likely a female. Taking a shower in a blood-spattered bathroom made no sense. Finally, Amanda's behavior her kissing and hugging Raphael didn't seem to them like the sort of grieving you'd expect from someone whose roommate had just been brutally murdered. During a second day of questioning, Amanda fueled suspicion when she denied using marijuana, a lie told at the request of her roommate Laura, who feared the legal possible ramifications from such a revelation. She also raised eyebrows when, after slipping on booties and gloves during a return visit to the villa with police, she thrust her arms out, like the lead in a musical, and sang out, Ta-da! Later in the evening, she went on a brief shopping expedition with Rafaela. 
Denied access to her own underclothes, she settled on a pair of red bikini briefs. That, too, would arouse the suspicion of investigators. Once investigators believe someone to be guilty, nearly any behavior out of the ordinary suddenly seems incriminatory. Day four of questioning was the worst, the day police succeeded in coercing Amanda to make what would eventually be recognized as a false confession. It happened without a defense lawyer being present, without Amanda being informed of her right to remain silent. When Officer Rita Fakara showed up in the waiting room to greet Amanda, she was on the floor, legs splayed, in the process of doing a split. That, too, would strike investigators as evidence of guilt. The interview probed deeply into Amanda's movements on the night of November 1st, her male acquaintances in Perugia, her interaction with Kircher. They asked about exact times, about details she couldn't remember. Eventually, according to her own account, I started forgetting everything. My mind was spinning. I felt as if I was going totally blank. They insisted that she must have met Patrick Lumumba, her boss, later that night, based on her 8.30 p.m. text to him that said, See you later. Americans would not understand that to be a literal plan. But the Italian meaning of those words is literal. They had agreed to meet later that night. When Amanda continued to assert that she never left Raphael sometime after 8.30, the investigators called her a liar. Police tactics can be rough. They falsely claimed that Raphael had confessed that they had left his apartment. They told her, you're going to go to prison for 30 years if you don't help us. At one point, Rika Ficara slapped Amanda on the back of her head then hit her a second time above the ear. Fikara, not surprisingly, denied this. To get her attention, Fikara said, the investigation took its toll. In Amanda's words, I snapped. When investigators insisted, you know who f***ed Meredith, she said, Patrick, it's Patrick. She was then asked whether Patrick had s*** with Meredith before he slashed her. Amanda said, I guess so. I'm confused. At 1.45 a.m., Amanda signed a confession, placing her at the murder scene and naming Patrick Lumumba as Meredith Stiller. The signing done, her investigators whooped and high-fived. A second spontaneous declaration, signed by Amanda a few hours later, included this sentence. I do not remember if Meredith screamed or if I heard any thuds because I was in shock but I could imagine what was going on. On the afternoon of the same day, Amanda would try to tell a different story, to say that what the signed statement said it did not reflect her actual memories, but it was too late. Amanda was arrested. Authorities charged Amanda, Raphael, and Patrick Lumumba with the murder of Kircher. Amanda didn't know she was charged with murder until her arraignment, three days after entering prison. Perugia's chief of police told reporters, the motive is sexual, very much so. The police investigation would continue for a year, but the crux of the case against Knox and Solicito was based on the four days of questioning after the murder. There was other evidence, but it would mostly turn out to be either fabrication or the result of shoddy police and lab work. A lab in Rome, for example, reported it found traces of both Amanda's and Meredith's DNA on a knife found in Raphael's apartment. The bra clasp found near Meredith's body was said to have Raphael's DNA on it. Damning if true, but actually the result of contamination. Raphael's kitchen knife was said to be the murder weapon, but the cut on Meredith's neck wasn't deep enough for that to be the case. Police jumped to the conclusion that shoe prints in the room were Raphael's, when later and closer analysis made clear that they were not. A witness emerged to claim he saw Amanda, Raphael, and Guide together on Halloween. But his credibility suffered a massive hit when he also said he saw Amanda and Raphael together in August, two months before they met. The police were forced to revise their theory of the case on November 10th when none of the fingerprint samples taken in the room matched any of the three persons charged with her. The prints did, however, 
match those of another man in the Perugia police files, Rudy Guede. Guede had taken a train out of Perugia the night of the murder. In a police-monitored Skype chat, authorities determined that Guede had fled to Germany. He was arrested in Mainz when his Nike shoes were found to have a print that more exactly matched the bloody print in Meredith's room than Raphael's. Police dropped the murder charge against Patrick Lumumba and filed murder charges against Guede. Watching the release of Patrick, Amanda later wrote, I felt an enormous emotional burden lift from my heart. One might think the arrest of Rudy Guede would cause authorities to reconsider their theory of the case. Wouldn't a murder carried out single-handedly by Guede best match the known facts of the case? But no. Authorities essentially decided to simply swap out Guede for Lumumba. The murder now was a result of a sex game gone bad involving Knox, Solicito, and Guede. Although Rudy had previously said Amanda has nothing to do with it, she wasn't there. Guede now helped authorities by making a statement, placing Amanda and Raphael at the murder scene. Guede claimed a fight over money between Amanda and Meredith sparked it off. The evidence of Guidi's guilt was overwhelming. The Kircher murder was a culmination of a recent series of break-ins by Guetta, and his DNA was everywhere. His lawyers requested an abbreviated trial before only a judge with no live witnesses. Under this option provided by the Italian justice system, the maximum sentence is reduced by a third from the maximum available in a jury trial. The pretrial proceedings for Amanda and Raphael commenced on September 18, 2008, lasting five weeks before being incorporated into Guedi's expedited trial. Judge Michelli convicted Guedi, sentencing him to 30 years, later reduced to 16. Subsequently, there was sufficient evidence for Amanda and Raphael to stand trial for murder. The full trial opened in January 2009 at Perugia's 15th Century Courthouse, featuring a panel of two judges and six jurors selected by computer. The courtroom, known as the Hall of Frescoes, saw the murder trial merged with a civil slander case against Amanda by Patrick Lumumba. Raphael appeared visibly anxious, while Amanda maintained a relaxed demeanor, often seen smiling in t-shirts, jeans, and sneakers. During the trial, court sessions were infrequent, occurring once or twice a week, extending the prosecution's case from January to June. Chief Prosecutor Giuliano Menini presented 20 witnesses, testifying about events surrounding November 1, 2007. An elderly witness reported hearing a scream around 11 p.m., followed by the sound of people fleeing from the house, which deeply unsettled her. Additionally, a homeless individual claimed to have seen Amanda and Raffaella near his bench on Piazza Grimana, overlooking the villa around 9.30 p.m. on the night of the murder. Furthermore, a grocery store owner testified to seeing Amanda purchasing cleaning products, presumably intended for cleaning the crime scene, on the morning of November 2nd. In February, the trial focused on Amanda's relationship with Meredith. Testimony from Meredith's British friends revealed her discomfort with Amanda's openness about sex and hygiene habits, such as not using a toilet brush. Robin Butterworth testified that Meredith found it odd for Amanda to openly display condoms and a vibrator in the bathroom. Amanda responded with a spontaneous declaration, explaining that the vibrator was a gift from a friend and meant as a joke. However, not all witnesses noted significant tension between the roommates. Philomena testified that they got along well. Forensic witnesses from the prosecution then took the stand. Officer Monica Napoleoni claimed the break-in was staged due to inconsistencies with the glass on the windowsill. She deemed Amanda and Raphael's accounts too strange to be credible. Officers denied mistreating Amanda during questioning, though they found her behavior, such as doing cartwheels and splits, inappropriate. The DNA evidence regarding knives and bra clasps was fiercely challenged by the defense with many observers agreeing that the results were unreliable due to potential contamination. On June 12th and 13th, the defense presented its case with Amanda Knox as its star witness. Amanda Knox, born... Sono Amanda Knox, sono nata. <laughs> July 9th, 1987. Nel uh, uh, luglio... 9th. 
Nel 9 luglio 1987 dell'87 um, a uh, Seattle, Washington. A Seattle, nello stato di Washington. In the US. Stati Uniti. When I got Thank there, I quando sono stata lì, I was sitting on my own doing my homework when um, a couple of police officers came to sit with me. They began to ask me the same questions that they had been asking me days and um, all these Anno. days and ever since it happened. Hanno iniziato a chiedermi le stesse domande che mi hanno fatto uh, da quando era successo. For instance, who could I imagine could be the person who... Per esempio, chi uh, avrei potuto immaginare che fosse... The person who killed Meredith. La persona che avesse ucciso Meredith. And I said I still didn't know. E ho detto, ma non lo so, uh, ancora non lo so. And um, so what they did is they brought me quindi, to, che è stato fatto, mi hanno portato, into another interrogation room. Mi hanno portato in un'altra stanza uh, dove si fanno le interrogazioni. Once I was in there, uh, una volta che ero lì, they asked me to, con, to repeat everything that I had said before. Di ripetere tutto quello che avevo detto prima. For instance, what I did that night. Per esempio, quello che avevo fatto quella notte. They asked me to see my phone. Mi hanno chiesto di vedere il mio telefono. Which I gave to them. Il quale ho dato loro. And they were looking through my phone. E um, guardavamo nel mio telefono. Which when they found the message. E questo è stato quando è stato trovato il messaggio. When I found when they found the message, quando hanno trovato il messaggio, they asked me if I had sent the message back. Mi hanno chiesto se avevo risposto, ha mandato un messaggio di risposta. Which I didn't remember doing. Che non ricordavo aver fatto. So what that's when they started being very hard with me. Questo è stato il momento in cui sono diventati molto duri con me. They called me a stupid liar. Mi hanno chiamato stupida bugiarda. And they said that I was trying to protect someone. E hanno detto che stavo cercando di proteggere qualcuno. Um, so Quindi, I was there and lì. they told me that I was trying to protect someone. E mi è stato detto che stavo cercando di proteggere qualcuno. But I wasn't trying to protect anyone. Ma non stavo proteggendo nessuno. And so I didn't know how to respond to them. Non sapevo come rispondere loro. They said that I had detto They said that I had left Raffaele's house, which was Che era andata via la, la casa di Raffaele, ciò non era vero. Which I denied. E ciò che ho negato. But they continued to call me a stupid liar. They were putting this telephone in front of my face going look mi look at your message il cellulare il telefono davanti e mi facevano guarda guarda i messaggi you were going to meet someone stavi per incontrare qualcuno and when i denied that they continued to call me a stupid liar e quando ho negato continuavano a chiamarmi stupida bugiarda from that point on da quel punto in poi da quel momento in poi i was very very scared Avevo tanta paura. Because they were treating me so badly and didn't understand why. While I was there, mentre ero lì, there was an interpreter. C'era un interprete. Who che who explained to me an experience of hers. Che mi ha spiegato un'esperienza uh, accaduta. Where she had gone through a traumatic experience. In cui aveva avuto una esperienza traumatica that she could not remember at che all. Non poteva, uh, per nulla. And she suggested that I e was traumatized. She suggested that I was traumatized. Che io ero traumatizzata. And that I couldn't remember the truth. This at first seemed ridiculous to me. Al, come prima cosa mi è sembrato ridicolo questa cosa. Because I remembered being at Raphael's house. Perché mi ricordavo di essere stata a casa di Raffaele. For sure. Sicuramente, per certo. 
I remember doing things at Raphael's house. Mi ricordo di aver fatto delle cose alla casa di Raffaele. I checked my emails before, oh. then we watched the movie. Ho guardato movie. le email, poi abbiamo visto il film. Uh, we had eaten dinner together, we had talked together. Abbiamo parlato, abbiamo mangiato, abbiamo cenato. And during that time I had left his apartment. Uh, e non avevo lasciato l'appartamento in quel uh, in quel frangente in quel momento. But ma they were insisting upon insistevano su putting everything into hourly segments. Um, volevano mettere tutto uh, su dei segmenti orari. And since I never look at the walk or at the clock, I wasn't able dato to tell che io them. Non avevo guardato l'orologio, non ero in grado di dire di dire loro what time exactly I did everything. While Rafael Solicito opted not to testify, as his lawyers believed it was in his best interest to keep the focus on Knox. However, testimony from defendants in Italy is often viewed skeptically as they are not sworn in and are generally believed to be lying. Amanda appeared composed on the stand, skillfully navigating the prosecutor's questions. She attempted to explain her seemingly peculiar actions, such as showering in a blood-spattered bathroom and her false accusation against Patrick Lumumba. Amanda described being slapped twice during her interrogation, emphasizing her desire to leave and her concern for her mother. Following her testimony, her lawyer praised her performance. After a two-month summer break, the trial resumed with conflicting testimony from forensic experts. The defense was confident that the prosecution's conclusions regarding the DNA evidence were untenable and requested an independent review. However, the judge denied this motion. In December, Prosecutor Giuliano Minini delivered the first closing argument, maintaining his assertion that the murder resulted from a game of sex and violence. He vividly described a hypothetical scenario where Amanda, enraged by Meredith's criticism of her sexual behavior, instigated the violence. Minini painted a gruesome picture of the events leading to Meredith's death, although he acknowledged it was only a hypothesis. Following Minini's argument, the prosecution presented a surreal 3D computer-generated animation depicting their version of the events, urging the jurors to sentence Amanda and Raphael to life imprisonment. Italian prosecutors submitted that the victim had been home alone. Knox, her former Italian boyfriend and a third mutual friend, had come to the house to attempt to persuade the victim to join a sexual orgy. A violent scuffle ensued and the victim was savagely stabbed in the neck. Knox and her accomplices then faked a burglary to cover up their crime. Next, Patrick Lumumba's civil attorney, Carlo Puccelli, portrayed Amanda as having a dual nature, a compassionate side and a diabolical one capable of extreme acts. During the defense's closing statements, Raphael's lawyer, Giulia Bongiorno, characterized Amanda as viewing the world through a naive lens, akin to the character Amelie from her favorite movie. He emphasized that her different perspective did not equate to guilt. Amanda's attorney, Carlo Vadova emphasized that condemning two innocent individuals would not bring justice to Meredith's memory or her family, urging the jurors to acquit. In her final plea, Amanda expressed her fear of being unjustly defined as a murderer, imploring the court to see beyond the accusations against her. Now, the wait for the verdict began. On December 4th, 2009, at 11 p.m., a guard informed Amanda in her cell at Capan Prison that the verdict was ready to be delivered, signaling it was time to return to court for the final judgment. At four minutes after midnight, the judges and jurors entered the courtroom. Shortly afterward, Judge Massé pronounced the verdict. Colpevole. Guilty. Amanda reacted with disbelief, moaning and repeating, no, no, no. The courtroom erupted with a mix of cheers and boos from spectators. Amanda received a sentence of 26 years in prison. Judge Massey's detailed 407-page report explaining the decision was released several months later. During the appeal process, which took place from December 11th 
2010 to June 29, 2011, Knox's and Solicito's lawyers filed appeals. With judges and juries having the authority to decide appeals based not only on legal errors, but also on new evidence and additional testimony. In her plea to the court, Knox maintained her innocence, emphasizing that she and Solicito did not commit the murder of Meredith. She urged the court to consider the possibility of a grave mistake. The court's first decision was whether to accept the case for review, and in a rare favorable outcome for Knox, the court agreed to review the case due to its complexity and the presence of reasonable doubt as announced by Judge Claudio Hellman. During the appeal, prosecution witnesses faced harsher criticism, and the judge and jury were more skeptical. Independent experts scrutinized the DNA evidence, concluding that contamination could explain most of the prosecution's incriminating test results. Professor Carlo Vecchiotti, among others, highlighted the poor quality and mixed nature of the DNA sample from Kircher's bra clasp. Additionally, testimony from Mario Alessi, a friend of Rudy Guetta, suggested Guetta had confessed to him about the murder, implicating another friend as the actual perpetrator who used a pocket knife with an ivory-colored handle. This alternate narrative seemed plausible to investigators, especially considering the presence of unidentified DNA at the crime scene. During the appeal process, revelations emerged that significantly swayed American public opinion in favor of Amanda's acquittal. Even Donald Trump voiced his support for Knox, urging Americans to boycott Italy if she was not freed. On October 3, 2011, 500 journalists from around the world gathered for the announcement of the verdict on appeal. When Judge Hellman declared Amanda and Raphael acquitted of all charges, except for the slander charge related to Amanda falsely accusing Lumumba as the killer, the courtroom erupted with mixed reactions. Some spectators cheered, while others booed. However, the slander sentence carried a prison term shorter than what Amanda had already served, effectively meaning she could return home. After returning home to Seattle with her family, Amanda Knox expressed her overwhelming emotions to a supportive crowd at the airport. Welcome home, Amanda! Yeah. As she landed in her hometown of Seattle just a few hours ago, Amanda Knox set foot on American soil for the first time in four years and finally spoke for herself. They're reminding me to speak in English because uh, I'm having problems with that. Um, it was an extraordinary moment in a case full of them. Even Knox herself couldn't seem to believe the moment she was now living was really happening. I'm, I'm really overwhelmed right now. Um, I was looking down from the airplane and it seemed like everything wasn't real. Um, what's important for me to say is just thank you to everyone who's believed in me, who's defended me, who's supported my family. For the um, Knox family, it all must seem so surreal. A little more than 24 hours ago, Amanda was sitting in an Italian courtroom, convicted of murder and serving a sentence that was supposed to keep her behind bars for a quarter century. Thanking everyone who believed in her and supported her family. The legal battles continued in Italy for another four years. In 2013, the Supreme Court of Cassation overturned the acquittals from the appeal and ordered a new trial. Despite being represented, Knox remained in the United States. In the subsequent trial, both Knox and Solicito were found guilty again. However, a final appeal was heard by the Supreme Court of Cassation in 2015, which definitively acquitted Amanda and Raphael of the murder charges. The court criticized the previous trials for glaring errors, sensational failures, investigative amnesia, and guilty omissions. Following her acquittal, Amanda Knox married author Christopher Robinson. She pursued a career in journalism, participated in events sponsored by The Innocence Project, and dedicated herself to raising awareness about wrongful convictions. Presently, she hosts a podcast titled The Truth About True Crime. As a potential juror in the Amanda Knox case, after carefully examining all the evidence presented, what would be your verdict? Do you agree or disagree with her acquittal? Consider the complexities of the case, including the forensic evidence, 
witness testimonies, and legal proceedings. Share your thoughts on whether you believe the evidence supports her innocence or guilt, and whether you feel the outcome of the trial was justified. Thanks for watching.